Well, welcome to the COVID thin version of uh, ENV 200. All the people on Zoom, we hope you get better or complete quarantine uh, without um, incident. Uh, I want to uh, talk today uh, and uh, uh, about the ethical and aesthetic dimensions of the food and biodiversity problem, and particularly the solutions of the food and biodiversity problems. And um, the style of the lecture today is very much a yo-yo. Um, there are dueling voices, and for each voice in one direction, there's a voice in the other. And so I want to give you some notion of the complexity, and in particular, the tension between um, sort of modern, locally focused conservation and food uh, system uh, issues, and the global solutions to the carbon and climate problem. Next time, I'll be talking about human conflict and the environmental nexus, which is a new area basically coming out of econometrics um, that shows how large the impact of climate is already on um, conflicts uh, throughout the world. And then Monday is our last lecture. And on Monday, we're going to be giving much more explicit instructions about the final, um, which will again be done electronically. And I know that uh, the majority of the students had to submit twice and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to make sure that's um, sorted. All right, so 2050 food demand. You've seen this a zillion times. Population grows. GDP per capita goes up, unless there's a crash of some catastrophic sort. Meat demand, we don't know. Food demand increases by 60%, maybe, um, unless meat demand well, food demand goes up, but you know, if a substantial of that is meat demand, that means that the amount of grain you need is a lot less. So fully solutions to the food problem, we talked about intensification is to close yield gaps. Um, uh, and then these, one of the reasons you need to do that is that um, increasing cropland and pasture at the expense of tropical forests would cause a mass extinction and a gigantic carbon, carbon emission from the deforestation. Um, uh, and again, the intensification is primarily by increasing rates of fertilizer and pesticide application. Second is reduced waste, and the third is to shift the diet away from meat and especially beef. And no one's going to object to fully solution number two. We all want to reduce waste, right? But one in three have important ethical and aesthetic dimensions. So sustainable intensification. Foley well, says we need a 58% increase in production by closing 95% of existing yield gaps. And who could object to this? And the answer is almost every proponent of slow, local, and uh, organic food. The, the idea is very much that I, I want to I emphasize that um, the local food movement builds community. The local food system and the people engaged in it build community. And this is an, an, an unqualified positive. So I'm not going to be talking about that. And let's just leave that to the side. But that's the reason, um, the, the sort of unassailable reason, to be engaged in such a movement. But I want to talk about other dimensions of it. So Michael Pollan is, a, is one spokesperson for the local food movement. It's all about organic farming and slow food and eating locally produced food, um, that industrial corn is bad, that sugar is in general bad, that obesity comes from the industrial food system, that diabetes comes from obesity, that insecticides poison the environment, that herbicides do too, that GMOs are harmful, not as much as genetically modified organisms, not so much in this country, but in Europe. This is a huge deal, and it is a deal in the United States. And that animal welfare finally really matters. All right, so this is the, this is what I, I guess I would characterize as the, the, um, the, the, the subjects in the modern food, food movement. Now, I do want to also emphasize that I'm highly sympathetic 
with this movement, even though I'm going to argue um, about um, why it's in tension with solving global, um, the global nexus problems. And one of the main reasons is that, as a scientist, I'm suspicious of the amount of chemistry um, that we're doing with our bodies. And, and the reason is not that I'm, uh, that, that, that I'm fearful of chemicals. In fact, I don't take the precautions I should with them in either my lab or my life. But the, the simple fact is that our apparatus for testing harm involves single factor experiments, one chemical at a time, exposed in control groups. That's the ideal situation. Once in a while, you get a sample size big enough to look at an interaction between two chemicals. And we, in fact, submit ourselves to thousands. And we have a biochemistry that, if you look at its wiring ring diagram, is, you know, at best, a Rube Goldberg device in which evolution has co-opted the same compound for multiple functions. And every biochemical pathway is influenced by a whole bunch of external compounds. And so there are many, many ways to disrupt each one. So the system is, un you know, is extremely complex. And there are zillions of ways to break it, and many more ways to break it with two chemicals than with one, and many more with three chemicals than two, and so on. So I think it's kind of inevitable that when you in inflict uh, you know, a thousand chemicals on yourself, that you're going to get problems that we can't detect with the scientific methods we currently use. And we can't even envision a way to sort of do this, right? I mean, I don't know how you would look for the interactions among 100 chemicals, all right? You just you can't get the sample size to do it. The only way you really can do it is to have a mechanistic understanding of the way the body works, right? That's really kind of the only way. And we are a long way from that. So I am sympathetic with this idea that moderation makes sense, um, especially because we're doing experiments with something we don't understand, and with, when a priori science reasons make you suspicious that there's going to be trouble, all right? Now, um, this is a pro-organics local view, and it's a quote by Marion Nessel and Michael Pollan. When you choose organics, you're voting with your fork for a planet with fewer pesticides, richer soil, and cleaner water supplies, all better in the long run. When you choose locally grown produce, you're voting for conservation of fuel resources and economic viability of local communities along with freshness and better taste. Once you consider such things, the choices in in the produce section are much easier to make. When I have a choice, here are my priorities. Organic and locally grown, one. Two, organic. Three, conventional and locally grown. And four, conventional. Um, so, uh, and so the conclusions are that each community's food system should be organic to maximize soil health and to involve only ecologically natural processes. Notice natural there. Local, that is constrained within its own food sh uh, uh, shed where food, where it naturally would have come from in pre-industrial pre times. Permaculture, which involves perennial plants and, and other kinds of practices that keep the ground covered with vegetation all the time to approximate agriculturally pr productive ecosystems in natural ecosystems and provide ecosystem services naturally and food sovereignty to be controlled by the community and reflect only their values and interest. And therefore, we should reject GMOs, global free trade regime for agriculture, monocultures, chemical fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and other intensive aspects of contemporary agriculture. Right? You've all heard this kind of rhetoric, and you've all read it. Um, an additional objection to intensification is that intensive animal production causes animal suffering and animal rights. Um, Peter Singer, who's a utilitarian, who has controversial views here at Princeton, um, has written extensively about this. And um, uh, you're not going to hear much objection um, here from me uh, ab about this. We'll just uh, um, uh, leave that as an additional uh, sort of argument, uh, but not the, not the primary one for local 
and organic food. Uh, Singer's position, incidentally, does align with Foley's solution number three, which is to uh, decrease the proportion of cropland going to animal feed. And of course, Foley's solution in 2011 is before the explosion of the meat substitute market, which we've talked about quite a bit here. Uh, the big problem with um, organic and permaculture, agriculture, is that um, it has lower yields. It's really hard to get the same yield that you get with intensive agriculture, full stop. Uh, you can cherish your plants and cherish your farm and do everything that you can for it, and you don't get the same yield. There's study after study after study that shows substantially decreased yields on organic farms. That's one of the reasons why organic produce is more expensive. Um, and so there are objections from the nexus point of view uh, about this, right? So, so what organic food means, in addition perhaps to greater health, is that you're gonna need more farmland to produce the same amount of food. And we're already constrained by the nexus problems with that. So increased forest clearing to produce that food. Remember, tropical forests are the only rain-fed places left where you could expand the agricultural system um, uh, would cause massive biodiversity loss. It is true that organic farmed landscapes have higher biodiversity than intensively farmed monoculture systems, but the biodiversity that they contain is a tiny fraction of a natural system. You know, they'll have three species, whereas an intensively farmed one will have one species of some sort of an insect, and then the natural system will have 132, right? It's like that. So, so only a little more. And so we take a system in which 80% of our threatened species are at risk because of habitat loss, and 90% of those are because of agricultural habitat loss, and now we're going to increase the agricultural area to feed the same amount of people. And so that really is a serious objection. It means you're trading off your local health against global biodiversity in this case, all right? And so that's a serious sort of ethical choice to consider. Another reason to worry about organics is that they cost more, right? And this is a graph. We're going to talk a lot about graphs like this next time. This is a graph of, of uh, food price shocks through history and um, that go back to the French Revolution. Each dot is a different food price shock. And the vertical axis is an index of social unrest with um, just acting up near zero and civil war higher, higher up into the hundreds. And so the important point is that when there are food price shocks, people historically go crazy, okay? And as we'll see, the people that go crazy are typically those who can no longer afford staples. It is a cliche, but it is literally true that when you can no longer feed your family, you, uh, for good reason, go ballistic, right? That's what happens. So, so, so if we're facing a world in which there are likely to be some food price shocks anyway because of climate disruption and because of increased demand for food, to shift to a lower yielding system is itself um, uh, potentially problematic. And of course also poor people can't currently afford, they're few food insecure because they have trouble, uh, uh, trouble paying uh, for, for food, affording food. And the reason that they tend to go ballistic when um, there are food price shocks is precisely because they have to pay such a high fraction of their income just for basic foodstuffs. And almost any model that looks at ill-designed land mitigation climate policies that cause a decrease in yield predict food price shocks, food price increases, not shocks, just general increases through time. So this is one from the Shockwaves report, but. Um, there it is. Also, um, I just wanted to emphasize that if we go to a system that is 100% renewable, and even if we don't, but especially if we do, then carbon-containing molecules become extremely valuable. 
all right? It, it is possible to make a hydrocarbon chemical by capturing CO2 and forcing it together with hydrogen and energy and forcing it uphill. But it is cheaper to form it from um, plant-based material. And so the Biden administration is likely to invest in hubs that are dedicated to figuring out how to substitute our petroleum-sourced um, um, uh, chemicals industry for a biologically sourced chemical industry. And that then makes biomass more valuable, which puts pressure on land, and so on. So the, the, this is a graph of how much biomass would be produced in the Net Zero America project study in the US in 2050 showing that the northern Midwest really makes out like bandits. But the point here is simply that it's not only the food system and biodiversity that are putting pressure on land here at the same time. Now, the reply of people in the organics business is that, you know, even if yields are lower in the short run, you're destroying the soil. And so if you wait long enough, the agricultural productivity is going to collapse like the red curve. And so it looks better now, but just wait. It's going to get worse. In contrast, organic farming builds the health of the soil and drives it upward. All right? And there may be some, some truth to this. But the reason that I've hand-drawn these figures is that I can't find any data curves that look like that, OK? I actually can't find a figure to show you that looks like that. And that should make you suspicious that this argument is, by and large, sounds great, but is kind of false. It does appear to be the case that you can keep an, a flow through industrial agricultural system productive in the same way that you could, you know, a, a chemostat or a flow through aquarium or terrarium system or something. Put everything in, let it all run out again, just keep it going. And, and so, and it is also true that there are other ways to build the soil. We talked about mineralization additions to the soil that increases its carbon backbone and so on. And so the scientific support of this assertion, I say is mixed at best, but it's actually um, essentially non-existent, all right? It, it's an argument that has to be true kind of at some level um, in that organic practices do increase the fertility of the soil without inputs. But it does appear as though the annual additions can, can compensate for that if your only metric is, is crop yield output. Another objection to organics is um, water, um, uh, and that we've already got a problem with needing to move food because we're moving water. But the bigger, bigger part of the water problem is not the organic versus intensive uh, axis, but the local versus global axis. A local food system requires that the food be produced locally. Coming water shortages given that most water is used for irrigated agriculture and all of a sudden the climate changes and there isn't the water to do it, means that you have to move food. So that we're going to need more international trade in food, not less international trade in food. And that means that while, at least along this dimension, individual communities and places that are otherwise food secure could choose local, um, for that reason, that lots of other people around the world will not have that luxury, all right? Because they're, they, they're already living in a place with borders that are not porous. That means that they either import their food or there isn't enough to eat. And finally, another objection to organics is that the deforestation causes massive carbon emissions. If you go to an organic, food system and you want to produce the same amount of food or a growing amount of food, you're going to need an increase uh, in, in agriculture, organic agricultural land area. And that means the loss of pristine rainforest carbon stores. And we've already seen repeatedly that a billion hectares of tropical forest converting it to cropland 
releases 800 tons of CO2 per hectare and would, in fact, put one and a half and even two degrees out of reach just in one fell swoop. So we really can't afford to increase our cropland. I mean, it's as simple as that. If we're going to solve the climate and biodiversity problems, we can't increase cropland area, all right? Just can't. All right, so another dimension of this problem is that natural is good, all right? I emphasized the, the, the uh, Marion and, and Pollen um, uh, 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 quotes, um, the words natural occurring all over the place. And you hear all the time that something is natural and therefore it's good. And the question is, why is natural good? So, so you should think about this, right? So, so on the one hand, you know, I've just argued that you um, put a thousand chemicals in the environment with every sort of structural scientific reason from, from your knowledge of biochemistry that they will interact in ways that are harmful to you, even though singly they might not hurt you. And then you confront that with a detection system that is incapable of detecting all but the simplest interactions. And then you're surprised when cancer rates go up, okay? Like that, right? On the one hand, you know, that's an argument for natural. But why are natural, why is natural in and of itself good? All right, that's a reason for why, why you might prefer um, low, for instance, um, uh, pesticide and herbicide use. But why is natural in and of itself good? Um, and, and um, you know, lots of natural behaviors are ethically abhorrent now, right? You just, oh, you only have to watch chimpanzee societies for a short period of time to realize that you don't want to live that way, probably. All right, so, so um, have you guys seen anything that looks like this yet? Okay, so this is a diagram um, that, that is, uh, um, I think, uh, kind of useful, and, and uh, I don't want to belabor this because I'm not an ethicist, but my um, scientist pea brain finds, uh, finds this kind of simple classification of ethical systems useful. So in, in the rows, we have ethical systems that are human-centered, they're anthropocentric. So things are valued only insofar as they benefit humanity humans or, or, or harm humans. And these are not human-centered, not anthropocentric, that, uh, anthropocentric, that other organisms or even other systems, like an ecosystem, has, um, uh, has value. And then the second axis here is um, intrinsic versus instrumental, that there is some sort of an intrinsic value that is valued in and of itself, that is that is a quality of the entity, human or non-human itself, versus those that are instrumental, that, that have value only because of the value that they provide to something else. So, so this yellow thing here is, is the way a lot of people think, that um, uh, this is the value that people have for their own sake, and this is an intrinsic right Right, an intrinsic quality of humanity. All right, that that uh, basic human worth and dignity. Down here we have the value that non-humans have for their own sake, the basis for respect, cherishing, and preservation. Um, and this is, you know, th this axis kind of flows out of, for instance, Peter Singer's utilitarianism, where he looks at sentience and the capacity to suffer, as as a uh, um, as important components of utility, and therefore other organisms that have some level of sentience and that, that uh, have a capacity to suffer have intrinsic value down here, okay? Over here we have instrumental, the value that a thing has for human individuals or communities. It's anthropocentric and, and, and instrumental. And this is, you know, um, endangered species may have educational, aesthetic, or medicinal value. They have values to our economy and to our well-being. And um, down here, we've got instrumental, non-human-centered, 
which is the value a thing has for non-humans. All right, so, 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 you know, this is, you value this because it's gorilla food or something, I mean, literally like that, okay? So I, I find this, this to be useful, and it's gonna be important when framing one of the primary, de the primary debate in the modern conservation movement. Okay, so, so let me return to uh, objections to what I see as the sort of modern food movement. What is the ethical objection to local? Well, I've already mentioned that we're gonna have to trade food because we can't trade water. But also, how is food sovereignty different than, different than protectionist values? A lot of liberals, um, myself inclu included, think that Brexit was a bad idea and are suspicious of protectionist foreign policies like those that Donald Trump um, pushed when he was president. And so why prioritize local control per se, right, as opposed to like, for instance, just well-being? So, so there are objections across the board. So if local and organic is healthier and more humane to animals, but worse for the nexus problems, what food system is best for society? What food system should we promote with policy? What should you eat as an individual consumer? And not to put too fine a point in it, on it, must you sacrifice your health to feed the world and protect the world's biodiversity? Okay? So I'd like you to just take out your clickers and answer yes or no. Huh? Where do I go? Does it go up here? Yeah. So answer yes or no. Must you sacrifice your health to feed the world and protect the world's biodiversity? You could think, yeah, it solved the nexus problems. People about done? Somebody has to push the button, push it quick. <laughs> okay. And the answer is no from 56% uh, of you. No, for 50, 64%, two thirds, one third, okay? So somebody who answered no, can you, um, can you be brave and, and uh, uh, shout out a reason for it? I, I would answer no. I think we're cleverer than that is the answer, okay. I think we can probably be cleverer than that. But there may be other, uh, does anybody else have another reason for it? And what about those who answered yes? This is a principled argument. Does somebody want to say anything about that? Come on, somebody, be brave. Yeah, thank you. That's right. I mean, we do all kinds of, um, we sacrifice. Um, I mean, we've all got masks on right now, and this are as, as much or more to protect others than to protect ourselves, right, if you're fully vaccinated. So anyway, let's move on. Do not end. <laughs> OK. All right. So. Yeah, here we are. <clears throat> and so what are the eth ethical, economic, and aesthetic arguments against anthropogenic mass extinction? So why is anthropogenic mass extinction a bad idea? And this is where I want to get into this um, uh, central debate um, about that, that uh, uh, got really nasty inside modern conservations. So, so this diagram, if you sort of look through it, you think, well, why should we preserve species? Why do, why do they care? Well, non-human species have aesthetic value. I would argue that most people want to preserve, the tiger, 
is, is such a symbol of the conservation movement, not because it's Princeton's mascot, but because tigers are beautiful. They have aesthetic value, all right? You might also argue that they're necessary for a healthy ecosystem, but I don't think anybody really thinks there are enough tigers, certainly not enough Siberian tigers, to keep that ecosystem healthy. It just seems like it would be a crime to kill the last one, right? And I think that has to do with their aesthetic value, but some might argue that it's due to their intrinsic value, that they have, that they have uh, intrinsic worth. Um, for instance, that comes from um, uh, uh, some um, aspect of utility that transcends humanity. Uh, Non-human species have utility because they can suffer, for instance. Now, I don't think anybody's thinking that I don't want to kill the last tiger because the tigers would have suffered. I mean, they're thinking it's like a crime to kill the last tiger. Non-human species are economically valuable. Now, this may sound callous, but this is, in fact, the primary public relations argument that modern conservation NGOs use to, to push conservation and to fundraise um, uh, to industry that non-human species are economically valuable. So how many people, just, just raise your hands. I, I've done this before, but for how many people, um, we, we in fact did a class poll, and more than half the class early in the class thought that non-human species being economically valuable was the primary reason for, for conservation. And I argued that it's primarily their aesthetic value. And so let's take a further look at that. And in fact, that's the divide in the conservation world. So it's the traditional conservation, the conservation of Audubon, for instance, and the new conservation, the conservation of the Nature Conservancy, for instance. And it has practical implications because what amounts to an ethical argument, an argument that is that, that arguments that stem from different quadrants of that four-panel ethical system diagram that I showed you that lead to alternative practical projects, practical choices for a conservation program and for how an organization is going to spend its money and how the world ought to prioritize conservation projects. So I think it's interesting. Uh, this guy, Michael Soule, who has died, um, was sort of the, the leading uh, rear guard actor in the traditional uh, conservation uh, movement. So traditional conservationists do not demand that humanitarians stop helping the poor or underprivileged, but that humanitarian-driven new conservationists demand that nature not be protected for its own sake, but it be protected only if it materially benefits human beings. So he's talking about the new conservation movement. And he argues that instead, um, uh, ecosystems have intrinsic value. He thinks they have um, some axiomatic intrinsic value, um, um, the right to exist, right? And, and, um, and that may be, but I think you can also just believe that they have aesthetic value for people and you get to much the same place. The new conservation, though, stresses only utilitarian values to humans and focuses on economic value. And this book, Natural Capital, um, by Peter Kareev and Gretchen Daly and Steve Polanski, is a good example. And these are the most prominent people in the conservation movement. Um, Peter Kareva was the... Uh, Nature Conservancy's chief scientist when, when this book was written. Gretchen Daly is an endowed chair and celebrated scientist at Stanford, runs the Natural Capital Project at Stanford, which is a big deal. Steve Polanski is one of the only economists in the National Academy of Sciences. He's a well-known um, environmental uh, economist. And so these are heavy hitters who are writing this natural capital in the new conservation business. And it is true that some individual species provide valuable ecosystem services. Pollination is a great example, right? Honeybees 
do a lot of our pollination, we move them in. It's an invasive species, and we move them in because they're good at pollinating crops that we cultivate, many of which have Eurasian origin, which as do, as do honeybees. But there's study after study after study that shows that if you have like hedgerows around your agricultural field, then you also get services from native bees. And the native bees are particularly important if, for instance, the honeybees have a bad year, right? And we all know that honeybees uh, are afflicted by a number of, in, um, of invasive diseases and even some predators like these gigantic Asian murder hornets that they keep catching in, in Washington state. There's a big deal in national, na no, I'm sorry, natural products pharmaceuticals. A good example is Artemisia annua for malaria, which was a traditional compound in Chinese medicine that now has made it into Western medicine as a cure for malaria. And this is a chemical that was distilled from wormwood, um, uh, but there's a guy named Jay Kiesling and his lab who, who decided to, to um, uh, get rich. <laughs> it's an interesting thing. They decided to get rich as scientists because they figured out this really clever way of slapping genes into yeast really quickly and making biologically sourced compounds out of it cheaply. But they decided that because they were going to get rich, they had to pay first. So they lived really poor and in a basement, stuck these Artemisia genes into uh, yeast, made tons of it, and then distributed it for free, right? and saved a whole bunch of people. And now they're, they're rich. Anyway, uh, so that's an interesting case. But a lot of these. Compounds. This was a huge business in the 50s, and most major pharmaceutical companies abandoned it because they started to reach diminishing returns. In other words, they would discover new compounds all the time, but the compounds just acted the way, so like some alkaloid that, you know, it's a new alkaloid, but we've already got it, three alkaloids that do the same thing. Bluefin tuna is a conservation um, cause celeb, and of course it's incredibly valuable because people value it as, as uh, food. You know, you can, you know, the bluefin tuna can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars because the sushi is so good. Um, the thing on the left there, those nodules are um, nodules in legume roots. And those nodules, amazingly, um, are created by the plant and they reproduce the atmosphere of two billion years ago before there was oxygen in the atmosphere. And they do so to cultivate an organism that evolved back then and takes nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and puts it into amino acids, right? So you can make protein out of air, basically, right? Protein out of air and plus carbon. Well, out of air, out of the CO2 and air from photosynthesis, put it into a hydrocarbon. And then the nitrogen from the nitrogen gas in the air. So it's a, it's a way to make protein out of air. And the organisms that live in there, the rhizobium organisms, are incredibly valuable. Um, our nitrogen uh, 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 availability, which determines productivity, determines the protein contents of plants, would be terrible if we didn't have legume plants like alfalfa to rotate with corn and other, and other crops. So, so there's no question about it that there are animals that have extreme value for humanity, um, uh, uh, values that are gigantic. And it's also the case that individual species are essential for ecosystems. We looked at this already. Remember the business about keystone species and the importance of apex predators? This guy, Bob Payne, discovered that the, the big predator in the Washington state intertidal, a starfish that's like that big called Pisaster, that if you removed it, the ecosystem collapsed to a monoculture of, I think, uh, gooseneck barnacle or mussels bed. It doesn't matter, a single species. And if, if Pisaster was there, you've got many, many species all coexisting quite happily. James Estes then discovered that in general, around the world, surprisingly top predators, like the tiger, are essential for maintaining ecosystems the way we see them. And that when they're removed, you get a fundamental and structural change in the ecosystem. And this caused everybody by surprise. So we looked at some examples. Remember the Tyrannosaurus, um, uh, Tyrannosaurus um, uh, killer whale 
that uh, eats the otter, that eats the urchin, that either causes a kelp forest or not, depending on which top predator is present. This is pisaster. Um, this is the mu muscle monodominance, yeah, it happens when you remove pisaster. This is a lake with large mouse bath and with bass and without it. This is a reef um, with uh, 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 sharks and other large predators present and without it. This is an algal flat, that's a coral reef. Um, this is with and without introduced bass in Briar Creek, Oklahoma. In other words, you can clean up the stream even by introducing artificially a top predator that isn't meant to be there. Um, this is a change in the Aleutians, uh, Aleutian Island landscapes. You can't see that very well, but there's a big change just by uh, uh, changing, um, uh, uh, removing Arctic foxes in the Aleutians. It's with and without pumas, jaguars, and harpy eagles in Venezuela, right? It, it's a, 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 a rainforest with many layers versus a rainforest that kind of looks like a temperate forest without an understory. Um, with and without wolves along streams in Yellowstone Park, you see it's all brushy here and it's grassland there. And with and without native ungulates in the Serengeti. The point is that in system after system after sister after system, the big fuzzy things matter. And they have indeed been the focus of conservation. Now, the flip side is, right, that we have also um, looked at experiments like this. And this is um, an experiment by a guy named Dave Tillman, who's at the University of Minnesota. And each one of these plots in this big field is a place that has a different number of native priority species um, planted into it. And so you plant one species, and there are 32 different species you can plant. Or you plant combinations of two, and then there are um, many combinations of two and many combinations of three and that sort of thing. You obviously can't do them all. Uh, and then you get up to combinations of, well, in this experiment, looks like 20 was the maximum in this particular experiment. But he has, this one had, had 32 in it. This is the kind of experiment that hadn't been done before, not because it's not obvious, it is obvious. The big pain in the neck is that, is not planning it, it's keeping it in that state. You have to weed that entire thing by hand, OK? So there are armies of poor, impoverished undergraduates who every summer are paid something like minimum wage to lay out on their bellies and weed that thing from sunrise to sunset. It sounds illegal, all right? But nonetheless, that's what this took. And, and, um, and what did it show? It showed that, um, in, in fact, the diversity, um, uh, don't have it on this scale, but diversity, uh, first, first of all, ecosystem function improves with diversity. Um, this experiment ran across a particularly severe drought year. And in that drought year, you could then look at the pre-drought, during drought, and post-drought performance and ask how how resilient was the ecosystem to an external perturbation like drought? And the answer is, the more species that there were in it, the more resilient it was. But, but that the effect kind of plateaued at about, you know, of order 10 species. Now, the reason for this effect is that to perform well during a drought, you need a drought-resistant species. And that drought-resistant species in a non-drought year is typically overtopped. It doesn't do so well. It's kind of dwindling along. It's slowly going extinct. But then the drought year comes along. It overtops everybody else, gets in the sunshine where it loves it. All of its neighbors are suffering. It grows really big. And it maintains the productivity of the system, right? And then it starts to suffer again in the non-drought years. But these experiments like this were recreated all over the world. And they kind of petered out. The diversity effects kind of petered out at, um, at 10. Um, and then this paper uh, came out in Nature in 2011. And the person simply asked, well, what happens if we look at all ecosystem functions from all of these experiments together? Because you don't want to just maintain productivity. You want to also maintain 
say evapotranspiration, and you would also, if it's an agricultural ecosystem, you also want to uh, maintain food productivity, and you also want to maintain a whole bunch of things, right? And so they looked at all these different ecosystem services, and the more ecosystem services you needed, you wanted to preserve, the higher the number of species you needed to achieve the asymptotic um, uh, part of the, uh, of the function where further increase in diversity doesn't matter anymore, okay? And so the argument there was that, yeah, well, maybe all the species really do sort of matter economically, all right? Maybe they, 84% of the 147 species looked at maintain some important ecosystem function, all right? So that argument says, yeah, um, this, this aspect of diversity matters. And so this debate still rages. So, so inside the Natural Capital product Project and inside the Nature Conservancy, you'll hear arguments about the value of this ecosystem, the services it provides to humanity, and that is front and simple, central in their, in their fundraising, please. And then there are other organizations that, that focus on you know, like images of the endangered species itself that a person cherishes. And they're appealing to a different sort of intrinsic value um, uh, out there. And so this is not resolved. What was weird is that it created acrimony between these two groups that were working for the same thing. So they wrote nasty, nasty, nasty things to each other and blew up the whole movement until a senior woman in the business told them all off and told them to shut up. And so it's kind of quiet now, but it's still simmering under the surface. So that's it for today. We're out of time. Next time, we're going to talk about human conflict and the environmental nexus problems.